Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Kelly Ann Bates. This is the most horrifying case I think I have ever covered. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Right, I think for this case we're going to have to have a big shake it off at the end because it is quite heavy. I normally, when I'm researching a case, I normally like look at an overview of the entire case, like somewhere really where like it's just, you know, what would you call that? You know, like if you read a book and you just read the um, the back cover, what is that called? Is that the synopsis? With this case, I did not do that. And I researched it as I like went, if you like. So I kind of started with the backstory and like it wasn't until I was three quarters of the way through research that I actually found out what happened in this case. If the universe had allowed me to read the overview, I would not have covered the case. So all I can think is that I was meant to, and that is why. So I hope I do it justice. This story is about Kelly Ann Bates. Kelly Ann was born on the 18th of May in 1978 in Manchester. For the life of me, cannot think of what people sound like in Manchester right now. Can't do it. She was from a very loving home. She had two brothers and a mum and a dad. They were a very close family unit. She was a tomboy. She loved playing football. She was very sporty. And she was really happy and bubbly. I like the word bubbly. I think people mistake bubbly for dim sometimes. <laughs> but those people are stupid, but I think that's wrong. Bubbly is fun, isn't it? Happy. Lovely bubbly. Oh, P.S. It's not as boiling today. I actually have trousers on and socks and slippers. Kelly Ann was also quite mature for her age. So she was drawn to older friends, if you like. I was quite like that as a teenager. I don't know about mature, but I did prefer the company of older people. But even though you're attracted to that and you like that and you feel more comfortable with older people, you're still young and you're still vulnerable and you still read things all wrong. Also, as a teenager, I feel like you see the best in everybody. And that can be a problem when you're drawn to older people. In 1993, Kellyanne was 14 years old and she was babysitting quite frequently for a bit of extra money. And one family in particular were friends with somebody called James Patterson Smith. Now, he would go out with them, they would come home, and then it would be time for Kellyanne to go home, back to her home. So this James Patterson Smith would walk her home because it was late at night sometimes. That seems like a nice thing to do. However, Smith's motives were not nice at all. James was 45, he was divorced and he was currently unemployed. And these walks home were just the beginning of Smith grooming 14-year-old Kellyanne. And this was not the first time that he had done this. In 1982, he had also groomed a 15-year-old girl called Wendy, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Kellyanne started to feel and believe that she was falling in love with Smith, but she knew better than to just tell her parents that, you know, oh, by the way, I'm having a relationship with a 45-year-old man. So she didn't. She kept it a secret. But, you know, you can't keep secrets like that from your parents very long. And she would sneak out of the house at night, things like that. So they knew something was going on and they talked to her about it because that's worrying. And she did divulge then that, yes, she had a boyfriend. He was a bit older than her and that she just wanted to go out and spend some time with him. She said he was called Dave Smith. At this time, her parents didn't really ask too many questions. They were just concerned about why she was sneaking out. And she'd given an answer for that. So things carried on. They assumed that Dave was a little bit older, like at college or something like that. They never, in their wildest dreams, believed that he would be 45. Over time, Smith would become ever more controlling and demanding of Kellyanne. He wanted control 
full control. So he wanted to know where she was all of the time and he would call her often to see where she was. It just became a lot. And Kellyanne's parents noticed that she was spending an awful lot of time. So it was increasing. The amount of time that she was at Dave's was was you know they sometimes it was it was a lot more than they were comfortable with they also noticed some changes in their happy bubbly child she started to lose weight she started to become less and less like herself but slowly over time this is common behavior for grooming and domestic violence where the victim is slowly stripped of their identity their self-worth and it's, it's over time, it's gradual. They also noticed that she would occasionally have injuries. The most worrying of these were bite marks. She said that they were from falling over wire and that it wasn't a bite mark, it was like a wire mark. She also came home with a black eye and said that she had been attacked by some girls when she was walking home. And other injuries as well, like over over this time, over this sort of year and a half, she had a bruised hand and her mum started to think, could this be something to do with Dave? Around this time as well, things started to come out. Things like all of a sudden this boyfriend, Dave, that they thought was in college, she divulged that he was 32. And this, you know, that's twice her age. She's 15 at this time now. And, you know, they weren't particularly happy with that, but they they could sense that if they were going to push the issue, they were going to push her away. So they didn't go too hard on it. Also, they hadn't met Dave. They had not met Dave. So they were trying to handle things quite gently. And her father did speak to her and say, is this what you really want? Are you happy? Because there was some sort of, changes to her and they've just found out that her boyfriend's 32. No daddy's going to like that, are they? I'm trying to be kind about it because I don't think that anyone needs any more judgment when something horrific happens. Like, And also, who are we to judge? We're not in that situation, never have, hopefully never will be. So I'm going to go easy on any judgment. However, they were very gentle. They were very gentle about it. After two years, I mean, I would never have got away with that. Having a boyfriend for like two years and and then my parents not meeting him. <sighs> it wouldn't have been worth it. Just the amount of like... Nah, 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 nah. What's he like? What's he do? What do you mean? What do you mean? Anywho, two years pass and eventually Kellyanne introduces her boyfriend, Dave. He's not called Dave. Smith to her parents, and it did not go well. He was arrogant. Kellyanne's mum said he walked around the place. He, like, sauntered around, and he was just cocky and very overconfident. I mean, mate, I mean, at this point, they think you're 32. They knew when they met him that he was not 32. He looked a lot older. He looks older than 45, to be fair, in the one picture that I have found. But, come on. Do you really, like, I don't know whether that was a power play. I don't know, but it did the job, let's say that, because I, I think they were terrified of him, to be fair. Kellyanne's mum, Margaret, I'm going to call her Margaret, she said that he he seemed odd and all of the hairs on the back of her neck stood up when she met him. She felt very uncomfortable, like there was definitely something wrong with him. And she felt like he he was evil. Like, I think she said that he exuded evil. And also, let's be real, at this point, you have just realised that your 16-year-old daughter, she's now 16, has been being groomed by this old man for two years. Like, you're just going to have that realisation, aren't you? Like, oh my gosh, awful. Must have just been pure dread. This is why I wouldn't have covered the case, because of the age. Because when I did have a brief look at literally the person and the age, it was 17, and I was thinking, oh, okay, yeah, I think I can handle that. But I didn't realise that all of the whole story went back to her being a young teenager, and it just gets me. I just don't like to think that it's real and I know that's so terrible and like I know that's just really naive of me but I just hate the thought that 
people actually exist that hurt kids. I just, just, and I just want to pretend that that's not real, please. Unicorns, bunnies, rainbows. <laughs> Kellyanne's mum remembers seeing a knife on the kitchen side. So when she's like in this moment with this evil man, she she clocked this, like in, in, in her house, she clocks a knife on the side and she remembers in that moment wanting to stab him with it, just wanting to pick it up and stab him. And she said she thought about that a lot, a lot of the time afterwards as well, because, yeah, she wishes she did it. After this fun meeting, can you imagine? Well, Kellyanne's mother became a detective. I said I was going to call her Margaret. Sorry, Margaret. As you would. Like, who is this guy? And there is definitely going to be, like, what, you know, he's like red flag central. Sadly, this is all just a little bit, what's the phrase? It's too little, too late. She finds out that his name is not Dave and that he's James Patterson Smith. She also discovers at this point his real age. So now he's 48. He's 48 and her daughter is 16. That's a 32 year age gap. Also, when researching this case, this did not seem like a case where two people meet and their kindred spirits and, you know, like the whole age gap thing when people fall in love. This was very much he groomed a young girl. Margaret confronted Smith about the age. You know, she said, why did why did you lie? Why did Kelly lie and say you were 32? Like, you must have known that she was lying about that. And he just said, well, I didn't want her to tell you the truth because then you wouldn't have let her see me. No shit, Sherlock. I, what does a 45-year-old man want to do with a 14-year-old girl? Let's just be real. Mm. Sadly, later that year, Kellyanne would move in with Smith. Just At this point, Margaret tries desperately to get Kellyanne back home. She, she does not want her to live with Smith. She contacts social services and she contacts the local police because she's at her wit's end. But they are unable to help because Kellyanne is over 16, so she can live where she wants, which seems batshit to me. She says that she loves Smith. That's how it works. That's why they're called predators. They're like hunting their prey, luring them in, making them feel safe. Oh, worst thing. And don't forget at this point, he has been manipulating and, and grooming her for two years. It's not a new thing. This has been going on for two years. Her parents are just catching up. It's just utterly devastating. And what nobody knows is Smith's past. Nobody knows this. He had a 10-year marriage, which ultimately ended because of violence. He was violent towards his wife. He then went on to have a two-year relationship with a younger woman. She was like 20 or 21. This also ended because of his violent behaviour. He smashed this girlfriend round the head with an ashtray. He would beat her regularly with an ashtray. He beat her when she was pregnant with their baby. And then he tried to drown her in the bath. Oh. He then, when that relationship ended, probably once he tried to drown her in the bath, he then met a 15-year-old girl, Wendy. She would sadly suffer in the same way increasingly abused and beaten until eventually he tried to drown her in the kitchen sink. And all of this is unknown because nobody has reported it. And you cannot help but think, I'm not blaming the people that didn't report it, but if only... Also important to mention that over these two years of the relationship, her parents have noticed that there are some injuries here and there. And like in the cases with his wife and this 20-year-old and and Wendy, they all reported that he it obviously didn't begin that way. It was a slow progression. And at the same time, these people strip away your self-esteem. So increasingly violent but also you just, you know, they're just sucking the life out of you, just making you feel worthless. And they also make it feel like it's your fault. So it's just, yeah, 
I don't like it because there's often a lot of victim blaming around the women. Why don't you just leave? Why don't you just leave? If it was that easy and that simple, some people do, some people do, and some people do eventually, and some people die. We're so quick to say, oh, well, they should have left. Oh, okay. They didn't leave and they died a horrific death. That's on them, is it? No. And again, sadly, the story is just repeating itself with Kellyanne. So she's now moved in with Smith. This gives him another element of control over her. She then tells her parents that she won't be seeing them very much. Stripping away, again, stripping away any sense of identity, security, and isolating her. She says that she's leaving a job that she loves, a part-time job, and she's taking up a full-time job, and she will also be doing overtime. And this isn't true. She's left her job, but she hasn't got another job lined up. So she is now just spending every single day in the house with Smith. Not healthy. This is because he wants that next step, that next level of control over her. But it seems so calculated, doesn't it? Seems so, like, for years, sometimes they're super nice and charming, get them nice things. And then slowly but surely, just this other side. Like, it's it feels so controlled. It feels like they can, like, they can control it for so long and then but I don't know it, it does fascinate me because I don't know why but it does it's really common in these cases for the dominant partner to to want to spend all of their time together because they know where they are they know that they're not out in the real world making friends or like they're also incredibly jealous people so they can't stand it they can't stand the thought of their their person being out in the world without them no that's got to end so they they manipulate it so that that happens like you've got to quit your job or you know or sometimes sabotage the situation so that they do lose their job all sorts of nasty things and usually once they have isolated the person that's when the abuse steps up a level Kellyanne became a prisoner she'd stopped going to her parents And on one occasion, her parents came to Smith's house. When they visited, Kellyanne was sat in a chair. She didn't speak. She had her head bowed and she looked awful. She looked like she'd lost even more weight. Her parents say they were just terrified to assert any dominance over the situation. So everything they did was sort of like behind closed doors so that he didn't know But also Kellyanne didn't know. So they were talking to the police. They were talking to social workers. But they were at a loss because she was old enough to make her own decisions. Her parents were also terrified that if they pushed her, they'd never see her again. Which is just... Slowly all visits ended. Slowly all phone calls ended. And Kellyanne refused to leave. She refused to leave. And knowing that she had a loving home that she could go back to, she refused to leave Smith. Her brother would go round to the property and ask to see his sister, and Smith would say she wasn't there. Even neighbours knocked on the door to ask if Kellyanne was okay. Was she okay? And they demanded to see her. So he showed her at a window. She's all right. I'm a little angry at that because why Why is no one ringing the police here? I know that her her parents are talking to the local police and they're just like... Mm, but, mm, mm. but a neighbour ringing and saying, look, we think that the girl next door is being beaten. You know, the police wouldn't go, oh, do you? Oh, um, oh I don't know. Oh, we don't we don't really deal with that. I don't know, they'd go round. It's just a bit odd. The police gave Margaret some leaflets to give to her daughter about domestic abuse and what to do if, if you're suffering from domestic abuse. I just feel like that's just a bit Jesus. The last thing I'd want to do is give someone that I think is in that situation something like a physical like do you know what I mean what if he found it like that could be end of 
oh, I know, what are you meant to do? But to me, I was like, oh, that gave me sweaty palms, that did. She didn't give it to her because she's not seeing her. The police said they couldn't intervene because he didn't have a criminal record and Kellyanne hadn't reported anything. So this is to them just like we don't like our our daughter's boyfriend, I suppose. Also, he hadn't been reported for domestic violence before. So they were like, there's no evidence that this guy is doing anything wrong. On the 10th of March in 1996, Kellyanne would ring her mother. It was a very normal phone conversation. And that would be the last conversation that they ever had. There is then no contact with Kellyanne for a month. And that month was possibly the most horrific month that you could you could really imagine for another human being. On the 16th of April, 1996, Smith walked into the local police station and he said that he had accidentally killed his girlfriend. He said that they had argued while she was in the bath and that she had swallowed bath water and died. He had tried to do CPR to no avail and then just left her there and walked to the police station. Good one. Freaking genius, eh? He obviously knew that he had to have a story to tell, like some sort of, like, what's that word? Like he tried to have a go at covering up what he'd done. But the police went straight to hit the address and they found Kellyanne, she was dead, and she was in the bedroom naked, and it was incredibly apparent that she had not just suffered from an accidental drowning. Kellyanne, in that month that she had been completely isolated from her family, her friend, from everybody, she had suffered sustained and traumatic and horrific violence torture it it's you can't it, it's torture he tortured her for weeks her cause of death was drowning that is how she had died she had over 150 injuries to her body and they were like over time so over that month they hadn't all happened on the day that she died so this had been a sustained torture campaign against her I'm going to read some of the injuries if you don't want to hear because, yeah, I'm going to do a timestamp because some of them are awful and the last one is horrific. So if you don't want to hear, th- this is also the point in my research where I was like, why did I, what? Hmm? We're going to shake this off at the end, okay? I promise you. <laughs> okay, timestamp, I'm going to put it on somewhere and we're going to, here I go. So her injuries included burns inflicted by an iron on her thigh, scalding on her buttocks and her legs, like with boiling water, smashed kneecaps. He he smashed her kneecaps. A broken arm, mutilation of her ears, nose, genitalia, stab wounds, stab wounds in her mouth, stab wounds that that didn't kill her so just it the everything that he did was to inflict a huge amount of pain and suffering but not to kill her sick oh he had partially scalped her there were injuries that had been made with a spade and pruning shears i didn't look any further into that i i don't want to know her hands had been crushed she'd been strangled with a rope she'd been starved she hadn't been given water for several days before her death. And that's not the worst of it. The worst, I'm going to say, if we can get it done with. So between five days and three weeks before her death, Smith had gouged her eyes out, both of her eyes, with his fingers. And then at a later date, he had stabbed the empty sockets. I can't even. Honestly, when I said the most horrific case, yeah, isn't it? Forensics found traces of Kellyanne's blood in every room of the house. Every room. Some of that would have been from the day that she was murdered and some of that would have just been throughout that month. They also found her hair on radiators and chairs and in a way that suggested that she'd been tied to these things by her hair. Also, they 
from the marks on her neck and things like that they they she uh, you know in those weeks she'd been also tethered to a radiator or a chair with a rope by her neck in her final moments Kellyanne was placed into a scalding hot bath she was beaten around the head with the shower head and then held underwater and I can't help but think that this piece of crap oh the vein I can't help but think that that would not have been the end if she'd have she was starved she was she was had no water but we know from before that he'd like drowned his ex-wife and the the 15 year old girl so it's almost like it's just that's part of the part of um like the torture and the control and to scare them and I think that if she'd have come out of that and she'd have been alive it would have carried on I don't I don't know whether he meant to actually kill her but she she I don't think she would have had much left it wouldn't have taken a lot think how much pain and suffering she was in despite that she begged for her life final thought on it because I'm it will make me upset but he must have made her feel so worthless that she didn't and you know she did she had a like within her right there she had a family and a home and she was loved she was loved did she know that did she believe that did she, did she believe that or did he make her feel like she wasn't wanted like they didn't care what a vile vile man in his interviews he's piece of oh god honestly i don't even want to give him much time but he just said that she drove him to it no 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 she drove him to it she used to mock him she asked for it she literally asked for everything that he ever did to her she requested he did he do it shut up jog on he pleaded not guilty. <laughs> As you can imagine, that evidence and the photos, oh my God, of all of her injuries were, it, it was horrific. And the jurors, I just feel so sorry for them as well. So her family had to, her, her parents, I don't think her parents read the full autopsy. They could never bring themselves to do it. And I'm not sure if they were in court. I didn't look, but the jurors they like it was horrifying so they were offered counseling professional counseling afterwards like all paid for and they all took it they all took it they took one hour one hour you know sometimes it's like oh four days three days a couple of days like 12 hours six hours one hour uh some of that would have been probably just going for a pee getting a glass of water having a coffee having a gin i would Whew. Do you know, like some of it would have just literally been, some of it might have just been them like, yeah, guilt, guilty. Like it probably was a minute. And the rest of the time they were like, let's just stretch our legs. Been sitting down quite a lot. Get a cuppa. That's what we do in the UK. Anything goes wrong, anything stressful, like, you know, bad day. Paul broke his finger once. He didn't break his finger. It's more to it. It's like a ligament, like snapped. It was like this. It's really weird. And um, he's a tradesman. And they had told us that the operation would mean he couldn't work for 12 weeks. Self-employed tradesman. That was fun. So we were in shock. And then he had this this operation and like a whole cast and all this. And we just drank tea. I I think I made about 10 cups of tea within two hours of him being home from hospital. It's what you do. So I, I reckon they had a few cups of tea. That's what I reckon. On the 19th of November in 1997, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. That makes me feel sick. I know that they that doesn't mean that after 20 years he's released. It means that he's eligible for parole after that. Um, but still, like to me, like Jesus, what he did and then that... The, the, you know there are options to um put somebody in prison for the, the and to, like bye bye forever why not why not don't get that i'd use one of them i would if i was that was me i'd use that he was eligible for parole in 2017 didn't get it 24 years after kellyanne's murder her mother margaret passed away she had had breast cancer twice and she'd had radiotherapy twice to treat it. 
and that left her um, immune system very compromised and she then caught like a respiratory disease and she also had asthma and then she sadly passed away but she had always said that she just couldn't wait to be reunited with Kellyanne so I hope that they are up there having a cup of tea together. That is all I have for you on today's horrifying case. There wasn't much light to be found in the dark today. Isn't it funny? You know, like that we just sort of like sit and listen to grisly tales. I mean, I do it as well. And then I research for hours on end and then I talk about it. Is there something wrong with me? Uh, sometimes I think, like, I hope they don't mind. Like, do you mind me talking about it? Tell you what is light relief. This weather. Oh my gosh, it's grey. I know you can't see. It's grey. It's been grey all day. Lush. And I'm not being sarcastic. I freaking love it. I could live in Iceland, 100%. It's been grey. It's been, it's drizzled all day. And I came alive. Oh just yeah isn't it funny like that stereotype of British people like we talk about the weather and then I think in nearly every video I've ever made I talk about the weather what am I cliche is that it stereotype yeah and I've talked about tea cup of tea in the rain what else I've been following a woman on um Facebook let me find a Oh, she cracks me up. She's from the US of A, Yorkshire Peach. She is she was was lived in America and now she is she lives in the UK. Has done for a bit, I think. But it's I, I just find her videos hilarious. She talks about the differences between the UK and the US. Loads of stuff. She does like she's just funny. I think you should check her out. I think you'd like her. I'm going to go in and watch a bit of her for a bit of light relief. Oh, we're going to shake it off. What should we do? What should we do to cheer us up now? What should we do? I can't think of a funny story. I can't think of anything funny. I'm just going to make a funny face. Is that funny? I was telling the boys this. If you, even if you smile, if you do that, it makes you look sad. So let us smile in. Doesn't it make you look sad? <laughs> anyway, I hope you have a wonderful week. I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. I hope the case didn't make you cry too much like it did me. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Syntronic. Hope you can join me next week. Next week for another true crime story in a glass or a tankard or a mug of tea or gin. Love you. Keep your eyes peeled on Tuesday. So where are we now? This will be Friday. So keep your eyes peeled on for Tuesday because I am releasing my Q&A video. So that video will be coming out on Tuesday. Oh, everything clicked. Click, click, click. Oh, oh, careful. Anyhow, love you, and I will see you all next week. Bye.